1922, when the tomb of Tutankhamun was opened, the pharaoh's body was found covered in a mass of flowers. They were the 3,000-year-old remains of a now rare plant, the blue water lily. For decades, Egyptologists have said that these flowers were purely symbolic. But a startling new theory has now emerged, that the blue lily is, in fact, a drug plant. In our society, hallucinogenic plants are largely treated with suspicion. But in many vanished cultures, they were regarded as sacred, a means of communicating with hidden, divine parts of the universe. As an archaeologist and anthropologist, I have been engaged in a journey into the forgotten realms of these mind-altering plants. Now my investigation was to go back towards the very beginnings of human civilization. Over the next three days, the very first scientific experiment would take place to investigate if the blue water lily of Egypt does indeed possess psychoactive properties. A team of specialists would gather at Hammerwood Park, a country house in East Sussex. Two volunteers, Marina Cartley and Robert Barnes, had agreed to drink on the second day of the investigation a dose of the lily while being observed for any effects. If the blue lily turned out to be psychoactive, our image of ancient Egypt could be radically changed. For what does it say about a culture if its supreme ruler is buried wearing a garland of drug plants? And the blue lily does not just appear around Tutankhamun's neck. It was the ancient Egyptians' most sacred plant. It's even depicted on the walls of the spectacular temple at Karnak. We already know that week-long festivals involving vast quantities of wine took place there. So could the blue lily have been part of the mix? Taking any hallucinogenic plant is potentially risky, and the volunteers could be entering perilous territory. The lily might contain dangerously toxic compounds, or it could very well turn out that it has no effects whatsoever. But could it just be that a lost drug would be rediscovered in the next few days? And might this open up an entirely new understanding of life in ancient Egypt? Late on the first afternoon, the investigations team of specialists arrived. Of course, the oh, of course answer. Okay. Yes, that would be uh, the answer. Michael Carmichael had participated in a previous investigation, and we welcomed him back to Hammerwood. A highly respected ethnobotanist with considerable expertise in Egyptology, Michael was ideally suited to the task ahead. Oh, hello, Alan. Hello, Good hello. to see you. How are you? Great, fine. Come and, come and have a cup of tea. Oh, things are not so these well. days. Professor Alan Lloyd, Chairman of the Egypt Exploration Society, is a distinguished Egyptologist. I am afraid, yes. But uh, well, Queen's is still there. I, I, yes, of course, I always think of it as Gordon Child's College. Well, why not? Um, why not? A very great man. Your greatest son, and, uh, well, what can I Dr. Susan Duty is a pharmacologist at King's College London. Her expertise would enable us to discover what, if any, the plant's action was on the brains and bodies of our volunteers. <laughs> In the library, I sketched out the story of the blue water lily. The spectacular blue water lily in Infer Kairalea would have been a common sight in ancient Egypt, growing in shallow waters along the banks of the Nile. Throughout their 3,000-year history, the ancient Egyptians prized this mysterious flower above all others. According to Egyptologists, the lily was the symbol of creation itself, the first object that emerged from watery chaos. 
and out of it was born one of the chief gods of Egyptian religion, the sun god, Ra. But why did they choose this flower above all others as their most sacred plant? A clue might lie in the art of ancient Egypt in which blue lily flowers frequently appear. They're easily recognized by their spiky blue shape. Here, for example, is someone smelling one of the open flowers. In their depictions, the lily is frequently shown in party scenes. In this one, two women dance naked before a group of onlookers who are holding the flowers. The lily also appears in other scenes of downright debauchery. It's this kind of evidence that has led one or two lone voices to suggest that the blue lily in fact contains a psychoactive substance that was widely used by the ancient Egyptians. It's even been suggested that these L-shaped wooden beer drinking tubes could also have been used to suck up concoctions of blue lily and wine. Here we see one of these tubes being used to drink from a jar of liquid. Their sieve-like ends would be perfect to prevent the petals being swallowed. But ever since the first Victorian pioneers, Egyptologists have ignored the theory that the blue lily was a drug used by the ancient Egyptians arguing that no evidence has been found to support it. But this is perhaps not surprising, since archaeologists generally haven't considered mind-altering drugs to be an important area of research. Later that evening, the two people who might help settle the argument arrived, our volunteers. Marie McCartney, a marketing executive, and media researcher Robert Barnes. Prior to this Marie, evening, Marie and Robert had never met. So, Marie, we all know why we're interested in this uh, subject, but we all wondered why you might be. Fascination. Um, the plant has never been scientifically tested before, um, and it's quite exciting to be part of that, I think. Mm -hmm. Robert, what's your motivation for all this? For me, it was really, why not? Um, as long as it wasn't physically or mentally damaging, I'm quite into trying out new experiences. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully I should be able to be helpful in this experiment. Robert and Marie would bring completely open minds to the experiment. Neither had heard of the Blue Lily before, and their knowledge of ancient Egypt generally was pretty scanty. What kind of things come into your mind when people say Egypt? Uh, firstly, uh, probably the Hollywood image of, of Egypt and um, mm -hmm. pyramids, pharaohs. I think what we are all wondering is... We the experiment's volunteers and specialists had now gathered. Only one thing was now missing. The blue lilies themselves. And as my guests continued their discussions, I reflected on the difficulties we had had in getting hold of the plants. There was little information about the blue water lily to go on. Certainly, none of the lilies we commonly see in this country are psychoactive. The plant is now extremely rare in the wild, and it was only after months of investigations that we eventually tracked down a handful of specimens to a botanical gardens in Cairo. These were then flown over to Stapley Water Gardens in Cheshire. But our problems didn't end there. It was the fresh, open flowers that were needed, for it was these that were always shown in the Egyptian paintings. Would the lilies recover from their journey and flower? And when they did, would it be in time for the planned date of our investigation? For the blue lily, flowers only once a year, and each flower head opens for just three days. Our luck was in, however, and we eventually managed to harvest 19 flowers. 
But how did the ancient Egyptians consume them? In party scenes, the lilies are often associated with wine, here actually wrapped around a wine jar. The lilies were therefore prepared by soaking them in wine. We knew from botanical studies that the blue lily contained a compound, nuciferine, that is soluble in alcohol. But other chemicals of the same group are not known to be psychoactive. However, based on its molecular structure, Susan Duty thought it possible that it could have psychoactive effects. If so, these might operate in two quite different directions. If we try and consider how the blue lily is going to affect behaviour, we have to consider that on the one hand it may cause sedation, but on the other hand it may cause arousal and excitement. That evening, the entire consignment of blue lily flowers harvested over the last few days had been packed and sent off to Hammerwood. But there were disagreements as to whether they would have any effects. Michael Carmichael was convinced that the blue lily was indeed a drug. The evidence is abundant, and it is clear that the ancient Egyptians were aware of the psychoactive properties of the plant. This is because it is frequently depicted directly in context with other known powerful psychoactive plants. In fact, these depictions are elaborate and prolific, particularly in the tomb of Tutankhamun. But as an Egyptologist, Allen was reluctant to accept Michael's position and preferred to demand written evidence that the ancient Egyptians knew about the psychoactive effects of the blue lily, which, he claimed, had not so far been discovered. There is no proof uh, in the papyri or indeed in any other Egyptological source that the ancient Egyptians were aware of any psychoactive properties that the, the blue lily may possess. If the lily is not uh, understood to be psychoactive in Egypt, Alan, which is your position, I think it would be, uh, I, I think you're walking in very dangerous territory there. The evidence, uh, it should speak for itself. I, I think it does. I, well, I, I hope you're not painting yourself into a very tight corner. I think this is an area where we, or rather these are several areas where we're going to have to dis uh, agree to disagree. Late that night, the consignment of blue lily flowers finally arrived. Tomorrow, Robert and Marie would eat and drink its contents. But what did the flask really contain? Nothing even remotely psychoactive? Or, just possibly, a forgotten drug that might reveal an entirely new picture of how the ancient Egyptians lived, how they parted, and what their religion was really like. The following morning, the precious harvest of blue lily flowers was unpacked, and work began on the task of preparing them for the day's experiment. We had gathered to investigate an ancient mystery. Is the blue water lily a lost drug plant, once beloved by the ancient Egyptians? Could it be that today, our two volunteers might step through a doorway and see the world as it might once have been seen in the time of the pharaohs. This would be the very first controlled scientific test of the blue lily, so no one could tell us with any certainty what effects it might have. Very possibly, none at all. But equally possibly, dangerous effects. So before our experiment could begin, our volunteers were given a basic medical examination. In the garden, Robert and Marie look forward to the day ahead with mixed feelings. Woke up this morning. Um, first thing I did was call my father, who obviously thinks I'm completely mad. Um, and after that, the realisation hit me that, yes, we were actually coming out here today and we were going to be um, taking this plant. I think if, if one line of argument is that the um, Egyptians 
well, sort of great party animals and this was used as part of that, then you've got to presume it's got to be a good feeling mm. if it happens. We don't know exactly how you, you make this, this special concoction. So a lot could go wrong, a lot could have gone wrong. But I'm sceptical anyway, so we'll see. It could be like, yeah, munching daffodils <laughs> and nothing happens. <laughs> Not that I've done that. There were several steps to take before the experiment could begin. First, the lily flowers had to be removed from the wine. In theory, if there were active chemicals in the flowers, these should have been extracted by the alcohol. The plan was that Robert and Marie would drink this wine once the flowers had been removed. Only 19 flowers had been harvested. There was no way of telling whether this would be enough to produce an effect. So we proceeded with the utmost care, collecting every last drop of extract. As we worked, we were acutely aware of the flower's rarity. And that the last time the blue lily had been prepared in this way could very possibly have been a thousand years before the Roman Empire. Preliminary tests had also to be made so that we could measure any changes Robert and Marie might experience. To measure any changes in alertness, Robert was shown a red dot which flickered with varying speeds. If his alertness increased having taken the lily, Robert would be able to detect higher frequencies of flicker. How your emotional state is Susan's next test level, so would detect any changes in activity in the visual centers of the brain. Now what you've got to do here is to actually read, not the word in this instance, but the colour that the word is written in. Right. So in other words, although this says red, I want you to say green and to click on the appropriate coloured box at the same time. Okay. okay. Green, green, red, blue, green, yellow, red, yellow, green, yellow, red, green, blue. For her final test, Susan had decided to track any emotional changes that Marie might experience. Okay, so what I want you to do then is to actually go along these one at a time and simply circle where you feel the most appropriate level of that particular emotion is. So let's start with interested. How interested do you feel at the moment? I think you'd have to give that an extremely interested. Okay, good. What about distressed? A little. A little distressed. A little distressed. The next one is uh, your state of upset. I don't think I'm upset. Marie answered with care, but how would her responses change having taken the lily? By mid-afternoon, everything was at last ready for the experiment. Our preliminary tests were complete and the flowers had been removed from the wine, which was now ready to be drunk. Because no one's done it before, it does give you a bit of a um, bit of a Star Trek thing, you know, like, to go, but no man has gone before. So fair enough, but something along those lines, I think. Yeah, slight temptation. Making history. Perhaps. <laughs> Just after five, we gathered for the experiment. Outside, it had started to rain heavily. With a few minutes to go before drinking the lily extract, Robert and Marie were feeling understandably apprehensive. How are you feeling? Quite nervous. <laughs> Quite nervous. I'm not feeling nervous anymore, actually. I think I'm just completely numb. While we had no reason to believe that the lily would have dangerous side effects, we had to remember that we were about to step into unknown territory unknown at least to modern science. Throughout that afternoon, therefore, our two volunteers would be under constant medical supervision. At 5.25, Robert and Marie drank the lily extract. Use my only Egyptian knowledge of Enkar Ek. Enkar Ek.
At first, things looked far from promising. Perhaps the whole experiment would come to nothing. How does it taste? It's quite bitter, almost like cider. But not common cider, more... My father used to brew some cider. <laughs> Um, I still feel nervous with it, and it oh. usually wine relaxes me. Yes. And it hasn't done that yet, but it's, it's quite soon. I don't feel anything yet from that. Good. Then, after 15 minutes, some first mild effects of the flower began. as if I'm standing on ceremony as much now. And I can, I'm, a, I'm more relaxed like that. Sort of, whatever happens now, I'm cool. Yeah. <laughs> See, my vocabulary's changed as well. Do it, it doesn't matter. It's no. good. Fine. No, I feel, I feel good. I feel, very, I feel quite excited now. Marie, how do you feel? I feel fine. I feel fine at the moment. Um, yeah, the only thing I feel is that I'm slightly flushed, but I'm just a lot more relaxed at the moment. Good. Intriguingly, the flower seemed to be having subtly different effects on our two volunteers. Marie seemed to have been relaxed, while Robert had grown more attentive. I do feel a bit giggly, um, but I don't, yeah, it could be nervous excitement, but I'm, I'm actually starting to feel a bit more chatty now. Robert, how, how are you feeling now? Yeah. I feel good. I feel well. <laughs> yeah. I feel, um, I feel very happy. I feel very laid back. What makes you happy? I <laughs> just got a big <laughs> smile on my face. Um, no, I feel good. How do you feel emotionally? <laughs> good. What do you mean? Well, I, I feel like I could just get up and walk out and I will <laughs> come and kiss the soldier. <laughs> but uh, I won't. And Marie, have you ever felt like this before? No, I've never felt like this before. Absolutely, no, nothing like I've felt before. Then, a new effect took hold. Marie and Robert grew restless. No, I, I just feel quite jolly. Do you feel jolly? I feel quite jolly. I want to, again, do some stuff. Yeah, I wouldn't mind doing something now, actually. What would you like to do? Walk, go for a walk outside, whether it's raining or not. Yeah, case so, on. Yeah. Do you fancy a walk? <laughs> How do you feel? Do you fancy a walk? That's I a fancy a walk and I think you'll enjoy it. Michael, like the rest of us, stayed indoors, however. If we were to observe any emotional effects the flower might have, it was very important that our volunteers had some time to themselves. But we were not entirely unhappy with this arrangement, since outside it was pouring with rain. But despite the bad weather, Robert and Marie insisted on escaping into the garden. <laughs> no, no, you've got, no, no. You've got to film these rabbits. They shed loads of them. But, no, no, no. It's going to make it look like I had visions then, but... Where's Mr. Carmichael? Dr. Carmichael. Robert now seemed entirely uninhibited about his TV appearance. That was just to worry you. <laughs> I am feeling cheeky, that's all. Yeah, I, mean, I was quite relaxed on the couch, but... You just feel like, um... Like we're tethered to the to the sofa a bit, mm. and you can't go out and do stuff. But if it wasn't raining, I'd be lying down. I think just. Yeah. No, I wouldn't want to drive. No, I'd be I'd be at 20 miles an hour, and I'd be pissing people off behind me, and I'd sort of let everyone in as well, which would be wouldn't get anywhere.
now thoroughly soaked, Robert and Marie decided to retreat to the front porch of the house. From inside the house, the team were managing to make some discreet observations. At present, they seem in very good humour. Mm, they certainly <laughs> do, don't they? Yes. yes. I'm definitely on something now. Definitely. Yeah? I'm not... Well, yeah. I feel very chatty. We're quite chatty. I'm definitely on something. Yeah? <laughs> he says... He says... To his mother on national television. Yeah. <laughs> Robert and Marie now appeared to be well into the first stage of the Blue Lilies effects. After some initial worries, my guests had quickly been caught up in what was taking place. When they started sipping away at it, I couldn't help feeling that things could go a little bit wrong, and I was very pleased when, in the end, they, uh, they'd finished the whole thing and they seemed uh, to be in pretty good shape. I think once I got over the, this fear that I had, the mm. same as you actually, about mm. you know what's actually going to happen here, mm. it, it did actually mm. get rather exciting, especially yes. when the giggling face yes. set in, and I, yes. I almost felt like I wanted to join them and yes. get on the front of the sofa rather than being, yes. you know, back Not where we were. in these circumstances is very infectious. But what was the precise nature of the strange Egyptian trip that Robert and Marie appeared to be going through? I feel pretty happy. I don't know why. I feel excessively happier. Maybe a bit more coherent. <laughs> you sound quite coherent at the moment, though. Inside, we debated whether to begin retesting our volunteers. To do so might mean interrupting the very mood that we were trying to investigate. You can't. I mean, if you, mm. There's always the trade-off between making mm. the measurements that you want to to mm. establish mm. the precise points of, of physiological change mm. and the need to uh, allow the, allow allow the, the, the social interaction. That's right. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I think that's what it, it is. Let's see if there's been any change in your... As soon as seemed appropriate, Susan began retesting. Right, it's, your systolic pressure is slightly up and your pulse is slightly down. So but while the Lily's effects were still evident in Marie, Robert had begun to feel that the experience was starting to wear off. So Susan rapidly went ahead with the flicker test. You see the, the mean value here of uh, your critical flicker fusion threshold? Yeah. 35.6 hertz. And your mean before was 35.3 hertz. That means that the two are not at all different. So at this stage, more than two hours now since you had the extract, there's absolutely no difference in the threshold for mm. your critical flicker fusion. So it doesn't look like at this stage your cortical arousal's any different than it was before. We had possibly waited too long before testing Robert again. But outside, Marie continued to report unusual effects. And you do pick out things quite clearly to listen to. Um, and I do keep going off on... I'm sorry, I'm not being rude, but I do just keep going off and staring at things. Um, very bad manners, but... Um, yeah, it's, it's quite... I think it's quite introverted, if that makes any sense. It's not... It's quite social because I can chat to you, but it is quite nice just to let your mind do what it likes and wander off and stare at things for a while. I've not had a feeling like this before. It's, it's almost, you know, when you're very, very tired and you, you can't really take in everything. You only can take in certain things. It's almost like that, but I don't feel tired. I feel quite alert. Um, it is rather good. I recommend it. However, this was not to be the end of Robert and Marie's encounter with the effects of the Blue Lily. We now knew that the Lily was safe, but also that its effects mm. seemed to be short-lived. So to make the most of our precious specimens, Robert and Marie decided to try and eat the flowers themselves. 
might they be able to generate further or different effects? What do you think? I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to live on it, I don't think. No, I don't think you could. Um, the flowers looked far from appetising, but Robert and Marie devoured them with an unnatural speed. They're really not good to eat, though. I suspect we observed the odd scene from indoors. Quite weird looking. Mm. But Look at the outside. I'm just getting used to it now. <laughs> if it was <laughs> in the Marks and Spencer salad, we see all that. Oh. They're certainly getting down them as if they are artichokes, actually. Mm. They're very similar to artichokes. That's yes, my impression. Yes. They smell like them. Yes, in, in, in vinegar. And, uh, and they're certainly not pulling any faces as if yes. they taste disgusting or anything. No, yes. they're not. Oh. They look like seaweed now. I don't know if it's because they've been soaking all day. We're nearly finished. Yes. The one thing we can be quite sure of is that at present they're uh, very clearly enjoying themselves. They yes. are, actually, yes. yes. I think, uh, and this mm. idea about partying and everything, mm. I mean, we, we heard on the first day how the, yes. the blue lily was yes. associated with partying and frivolity mm. and they yes. certainly mm. look like uh, yes. they'd enjoy a party at the moment. <laughs> That's right. Then the flower's uh, effects appeared to return. Um, it's really going all over the place. I mean, um, yeah, I don't know. five minutes ago I thought, uh, it's over. Probably because I've eaten these. It's sort of sparked up again, but... It's going to be quite hard because I'm going to see this tomorrow and sort of think, oh, what was I doing? While the blue lily was still clearly active, Susan decided to try the emotional state test once again on Marie. OK, well, we've got this one to do first. We okay. want to know how you're feeling. Um, I'm sure you've got lots to tell us. I'm sure it's going to be very different to before. Your, you no. know how had the lily affected Marie's emotional state? Okay. So, um, interested. Are you still interested in all of this? Or? Yeah, but in, in a different way. I'm not interested in what it's going to do to me because I've done it. Oh dear, you are chatty, aren't you? I think we've just I'm got to stick to uh, okay, not sorry. where it's not. No, no, I'm, I'm moderately interested. I haven't asked you yet. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's empty. In contrast to her painstaking approach earlier on in the day, Good, well, I'm Marie was now completely really, unconcerned know, happy, and seemed more interested in having a chat it. than in doing the test. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> it's a better circle than before. Apparently if you can draw a complete yes, circle, you're an idiot. So I shan't always do it. So that's what it does to you then, the blue lily. OK, so what about distressed? How... No, not that. How distressed are you? I'm oh, good. Excited? Meanwhile, Michael also tried to get to the bottom of the emotional changes Robert and Marie had been going through. I think she's, she's, she's a lot more um, talkative now. I think it's maybe affecting her quite a bit. OK, so the last one, last time, you were feeling sensual. completely non-sensual. Um, I remember that. How sensual. are you feeling any more sensual now? Or <laughs> you still as detached as ever from the rest of us? Oh, what, no, do you mean, as in, if well, I was feeling sensual, I'd feel attached to all of you? Well, I don't know. Oh, in that case, I'm what? very attached to all of you, so I'll give it quite a bit. No, I won't. That's no, depend, that. depends how you feel now. Um, do you feel like hugging and touching people? Yeah, yeah, I feel quite feel friendly like towards people. No, no, I feel like um, chatting to people. and So if that counts as sensual, then yes. It uh, alters your perception for the better. You, you know, you can notice more things, but I think she's slightly fuzzier in how she's sort of coping with things. She's drifting off a bit. Yellow. As the day Green. drew to a close, Red. Susan Green. performed her Red. final test Blue. on Marie, Yellow. who was now reporting that she was feeling Yellow. unnaturally Green. tired. Red. Yellow. Green. Blue. I've had a chance to uh, mull over the data now, comparing the results that we obtained with Marie before her taking the extract and the results that we've just obtained after she's taken the extract. And um, the biggest change really has been that it's taken her longer to complete the task this time, which suggests that she may be slightly sedated. This was certainly in line with Susan's predictions. As the second day of the investigation came to an end, both Marie and Robert were now showing strong signs of sedation. Although its effects had been mild, we had, for the first time in history, scientifically observed the psychoactive properties of the blue lily. But did the ancient Egyptians really use it as a drug? In the morning, free of the flower's effects, Robert and Marie might be able to throw some light 
on this mysterious question. Well, actually, yes. Uh, what about passing me one The next first day, day the team gathered at breakfast for some initial reactions. Robert and Marie had faint headaches, evidence of yesterday's blue lily eating. There's a bit in the middle of it that's quite sweet and yeah. like a gloopy texture, yeah. and that's quite nice, but the rest of it is quite bitter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's not but no, not, it's not like an artichoke, it's not like an artichoke. But you tipped them all down. Was that simply in the line of duty? <laughs> After a while, it wasn't a pleasure, no. <laughs> Determined to see it through to yes. the bitter end. They're quite more rich, though, for some reason. I'm very curious about the time that uh, you spent away from us yesterday, and we'd very much like to hear more about your experiences then. I'm very glad mm. that we went out of here for an hour, two hours. Why, why was that? Were you getting a little bit irritated um, by us? Not all? irritated, Hot no. Chewing. No, not irritated at all, but I mean, it's quite a hard, um, quite a hard, awkward situation. Mm. It's not. I guess it is. It's not normally, very natural. It's yeah, you wouldn't normally. normally you would. I don't think um, sort of take that plant <coughs> in a room full of people watching you mm. like that. I mean, you'd, it's, yeah. it's obviously <laughs> if it was used, it was a social thing. Mm. Exactly. How yes, very yeah. true. How very true. Obviously, you know, our intrusions and invasions were really not enhancing the uh, <laughs> effects of the uh, the plant. It didn't really <clears throat> contribute to the favorable set and setting atmosphere that uh, obviously would have been available to earlier cultures like the Egyptians. Do you think, do you think you're at all... Could you sort of go and curl up in a ball and have a nice sleep? I don't think I could sleep in that right now, no. After breakfast, we watched clips of the previous day's experiments. Any massive feelings of, as Robert was saying, the need to run around or not very energetic, just quite relaxed. Hmm, it is rather good. I recommend it. I'm definitely on something. He says, he says to his mother on national television. Yeah. <laughs> so, exactly what had the experience been Fair. like? I've not experienced anything like that before. My mind felt very alert, and yet at the same time I was very physically relaxed. For, for me, contentment, relaxa relaxation feeling, um, happiness, cheekiness, I felt a bit mischievous for quite a while, um, uh, and increased awareness. How did you feel when you went outside? <laughs> Much happier to be outside, even though I have got a cold today because of it. <laughs> but, um, but I didn't expect to feel that um, relaxed and talkative in, in front of a camera yeah. outside in the rain. <laughs> Not unexpectedly, yes. Alan was more sceptical. Uh, we, we all know something about the way drugs are supposed to operate. Could it be the case that... Uh, what we have here is an element of auto-suggestion and respond, responding to the, the situation you were in. I do almost resent the fact that um, Alan thinks that I put it on for the cameras. I kind of resent that. Yeah, I've, I've got absolutely no doubt in my mind that, that there is some degree of effect from this, this part. Mm -hmm. um, no, yeah, I would say that it was it increased alertness, but um, I felt more relaxed. I felt more yes, yes, confident, um, comfortable, mm. calm. Mm. I just felt really yeah happy, mm. a very positive feeling. The whole time this experiment was being conducted, both Robert and myself were trying to balance out our feelings. I was saying, I feel this going on, but that could be. Mm. through this and I did try and keep sort mm. of quite well balanced throughout mm. I mean I don't think you saw me running around like an idiot or saying oh I'm gonna go and hug trees I didn't feel like that mm. I gave you my honest feelings about how I felt and I would say that there is something more um, and Michael thought that with a stronger dose the effects could have been more powerful I think you know that another important factor is that we did we are working with a very low dosage level here in fact a minimal dosage level apparently and that, of course, is by far the best policy at this stage in an unknown quantity. And uh, in the absence of, of, of competent data to indicate the toxicity. In the library, we discussed our conclusions. Well, we agreed that the blue lily was a drug. Well, I think I saw the psychoactive effects of the blue lily. I think we saw 
perhaps the sort of experience that was taking place in the 18th dynasty, in the palaces at Akhetaten and Thebes, in the royal lineage, in the palaces of Tutankhamun. I think both of our subjects have expressed quite clearly and categorically that what they were feeling was very different. Euphoria with a state of tranquilization is possibly the nearest description that I can give you at the moment about the effects of the lily. Yes. Even Allen was now convinced that the blue lily was psychoactive. I felt, uh, as a non-medical person, that we had enough uh, on screen in front of us to be reasonably confident uh, that we were confronted with a little more than the effects uh, of a glass of wine. So no one doubted that we had rediscovered a drug. But what were the consequences of this? I think the evidence is extremely clear. We have abundant evidence to place the blue lily into its proper context as a powerful drug used by the Egyptian priesthood and by the Egyptian royalty. Uh, it's uh, depicted countless uh, uh, times in direct juxtaposition with other very powerful uh, drug plants. And clearly, the psychoactive properties of the blue li lily do solve the equation as to why it was, in fact, sacred in ancient Egypt. Alan had agreed that the blue lily was a drug, but he was still not prepared at this stage to accept that the Egyptians used it. The line I would have to take would be less positive than, than Michael's, but at this stage, Michael and you will be expecting that. Uh, I would take the view that Egyptologists will want to consider carefully the implications of the fact that the blue lily has psychoactive properties. But we haven't demonstrated anything uh, about what was going on in ancient Egypt. We need other sorts of evidence to enable us to do that. The Egyptians are by far an extremely wide margin, the most uh, elegant and most knowledgeable chemists of the ancient world. Their practice of mummification was the ultimate secret high technology of the ancient world. It's, it is difficult uh, to imagine that they were not familiar with its psychoactive properties. No, I'm not saying that. Uh, I'm saying that uh, th 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 there is uh, a possibility that the Egyptians were aware of the psychoactive properties of the plant, but at present I see no uh, evidence uh, to prove uh, that this is relevant. Can I bring this discussion slightly back down to the actual emotions of our two subjects? Mm. If we're thinking about partying, for example, mm. both of our subjects were very talkative they felt very relaxed, and they were also very happy. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, those seem the ideal, the ideal conditions for one to go out and enjoy a party. The effects of the blue lily appear, in some ways, to be similar to the effects of MDMA or ecstasy. Does this mean, then, that the Egyptians used the lily as some kind of party drug? It could well have been used in the party context that we have seen, in the festive scenes where the uh, ladies are wearing them as uh, uh, ornaments on their heads. They might well have ended the evening by eating the lily with uh, a companion. But Michael thought partying was only the beginning of the story. We've probably seen really the minimal level of dosage. So, uh, you know, the typical uh, dosage level may well have been considerably higher in ancient Egypt. In fact, it, it would appear to have been. Because of this, it would have been used in order to facilitate deeper levels of shamanistic trance by the um, higher levels of the priestly caste. I wouldn't wish to deny the possibility that the Egyptians, the possibility that the Egyptians were aware of the psychoactive dimensions of the plant. That, uh, but t to go further to uh, your position where we are arguing that the, the priesthood are using it as a device to enter a shamanistic state. That, I think, goes considerably beyond the evidence we have. I think what Michael's trying to describe is a sort of special knowledge cultivated by a priestly caste that was actually possibly even kept secret, which is why there's so little explicit description of it. So this is a rather fundamental uh, new interpretation that you're putting forward of, of, of Egyptian religion, isn't it, Michael? 
Well, yes, I would say that it is a, a fundamental uh, feature of, of Egyptian religion, and this is why we, uh, I, st I said that we could be standing on the threshold of a revolutionary breakthrough. In fact, we are transforming our understanding of Egyptian religion from that which is driven by a theory founded entirely on symbolism to one that is based upon a chemical or a scientific interpretation of the data. I see no evidence of that. Despite our experiment, Alan was still skeptical that the Egyptians held the blue lily sacred because it was a drug. I still get the feeling you're not taking the next and obvious step. Mm -hmm. is, is there some reason why traditionally Egyptologists have been suspicious about this kind of explanation? There is not the kind of evidence available which uh, an Egyptologist would regard uh, as the closest you can get to prove positive in this kind of discourse uh, that these, uh, these plants were being used uh, psychoactively uh, in the way that we're discussing. But I have never denied the possibility that this was going on. But even Alan admitted that our experiment would prompt further investigations. Clearly Egyptologists will have to consider uh, the implications of the current debate. They will go back to, to their evidence to see if there are any, any uh, signs that haven't been spotted uh, of the, uh, the use of psychoactive substances. Undoubtedly, the, the hair has been started, but uh, I think I would have to take the line that there's a distinct possibility that the poor chap might get shot. Susan thought that science would sit up and take notice. I'm sure many scientists watching this program will be intrigued as to uh, exactly how we're going to develop this, these ideas that we've been discussing now. We do need to bear in mind, of course, that these psychoactive properties have only been seen in two subjects. So I would certainly love to see this happening in more people before we start to really make firm decisions about the psychoactive properties and the relevance it has in ancient Egypt. And Michael was not one to play down the consequences. But the important thing is that we uh, more or less agree from differing viewpoints and differing rationales that we did see the effect of a, at least a psychoactive or psychodisleptic uh, uh, compound in action and that this is the basis for uh, additional research. And while it might seem like a small step to take for an Egyptologist, I think it's a quantum leap forward for Egyptology. It had been a historic weekend. We had confirmed that the blue lily, now an increasingly rare plant, is in fact a drug, possibly of major cultural importance. If true, Michael's theories about the importance of the lily in parties and religious ceremonies could lead to a very different picture of life in ancient Egypt. So, 3,000 years into the past, at the roots of human civilization, my journey had come to an end. Over the course of my four investigations, we had caught glimpses of strange worlds, other realities that few will be privileged to see. The bizarre visual distortions of the fly agaric mushroom, the deeply felt laughter of salvia divinorum, the aerial hallucinations of Henbei. It had long been my belief that sacred drug plants, largely ignored by modern science, have played a vitally important role in human history. Now it appeared that at the heart of life in ancient Egypt, the civilization that lies at the source of so much of our culture, lay yet another of these extraordinary plants, the blue water lily. Well, that was the last in the series, and don't forget you can join the Sacred Weed team now for live chat on the web at www.channel4.com.